Good evening, good evening, good evening. Welcome once again to another edition of Riot Starter TV here on Black Power Media. Um, I am excited. I am, um, I'm just ready to be a student tonight. You know what I mean? I've done uh, a whole lot of interviews in my short time. Um, and, and here at Black Power Media, of course, we've been on this particular platform. And we've, this platform has been in existence for less than a year's time. But we've had some greats come on and join us uh, from all over the planet. You know, and some of the folks we had on, we probably think uh, they kind of seem like they're from a whole nother planet. But uh, tonight, you know, is, 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 is so important because of the fact that we're talking about um, one of the people who uh, is the reason why I ever was interested in becoming a freedom fighter. One of the people who is, uh, I, I would call the, probably the most, one of the most popular Africans to come out of this particular continent over here in North America. Um, and I'm talking about none other than El Hajj Malik Shabazz, uh, commonly known as Malcolm X. Um, beautiful thing about this particular human is that um for folks who come from places like where i'm from from what we call the hood you know and we're able to have the ability to transform you know malcolm was that guy so um in my lifetime i've met a few different people who worked with him and and i know a few different people that work with him the late yuri kochiyama who was a good friend of his um, Baba Herman Ferguson, who is both now ancestors, Yuri, shared the same birth date as Malcolm, along with Ho Chi Minh, um, and Muhammad Ahmed, known as Max Stanford. But tonight, I have uh, two individuals joining me who are, I would consider, uh, two of the foremost authorities on, on Malcolm in regards to his life. One... Um, is a, a biographer and the other is a historian but their works are um, uncontested you know and you know so gratefully and to help me along with this ride one of them is actually going to be my special guest co-host tonight and um he is a uh, in 1990 this highland park michigan native uh excuse me one second this highland park michigan native served as a historical researcher and consultant for two episodes featuring malcolm x and eyes on the prize too uh he the, also the pbs history of the modern civil rights move which was on the pb the pbs history of the modern civil rights movement sorry about that in 1991 he was the chief historical consultant for spike lee's malcolm x biopic starring denzel washington in 1994 he was the special research consultant for malcolm x make it plain uh, an episode of the PBS historical series, The American Experience. Um, that is just like a, a very brief uh, intro as to who he is. I mean, he's a brother who spent pretty much the majority of his life researching and studying Malcolm and getting to know his family. I want to welcome tonight uh, our brother, Paul Lee. Who he is. I mean, he's a brother. Who brother Paul, how you doing today? The majority of his life. I'm fine, brother, but I'm, I'm getting a feedback. I'm hearing you echo. Is there something that I need to do? Um, someone playing the YouTube video or something? It sounds like somebody's actually playing the, uh, the video in the background. 
Hold on, I'm getting a feedback. I'm hearing you echo. Okay, someone, someone has the... Uh, Someone playing the YouTube video or something like that. I'm not. I, I don't know what's going on with that. Um, it's crazy. Uh, I don't know. It's, uh, it's not Peter, is it? Give us one second so we can uh, get this going. Do you have any headphones, uh, Paul? Yeah, I got headphones. Yeah, I'm going to get some headphones. Give me one second. Okay. Yes, sir. 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 Brother Paul Lee, um, again, his work, anything serious on Malcolm, pretty much uh, we we've we we we've seen it, we've we've heard it, you know. So um, definitely want to uh, you know take the time to enjoy his presence because of the fact that again he's a uh, along with our other guests a um, an icon when it comes to to this work so definitely we're gonna uh wait for paul to grab his headphones and he'll be right back with us in a few seconds y'all come on in and if it's your first time coming to black power media you know definitely hit the subscribe button and and we want to welcome you you know to our program and make sure you check out some of our past works because in fact we have a whole lot of uh serious things going on so definitely uh we're bringing brother paul lee back Okay. Paul, can you hear me? You back in effect, Paul? Okay. Can you hear us, Paul? Yes. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. We got you good. Forgive okay, me, brother. I'm 61 years old. I'm not that technical. Hey, brother. Yes. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm younger than you, and I'm not that technical. Don't worry about <laughs> it. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, man, definitely welcome to the program, man. I appreciate you coming on to join us tonight. How's everything going? Peace. Can you hear me, Paul? Okay. Look like uh, you finding a way. You there? I'm still getting the echo. Okay. I'm still You're hearing still the play behind me. Okay, do you have it? Uh, you have another tab because it might be a tab in the background playing or something. I don't know if it's no. You may have to close whatever tab. No, I just okay. opened up one. That's that's wild. I'm not getting. I'm not hearing the echo now, so I'm not sure. But you're hearing the uh, hearing the feedback. You're saying. There you go. We're good. Okay, you got it. We're good now. Okay, cool, <clears throat> cool, cool. All right. Thank you all again for joining us. Uh, so, Paul. You know what what i would like to do because of the fact that i know that um our guests our special guest tonight uh along with our special guest co-host you are way more familiar with uh his brother peter goldman um he is a icon and, and one of the most um important scholars when it comes to or, or biographers when it comes to uh brother malcolm so um if you don't mind i want to give you the distinct honor of introducing our guest please uh Kalonja, before we do that i wanted to thank uh in public but i thanked you in private on november 9th you had uh dr greg carr who i still call by the name he introduced himself to me kamati because of such an honorable name i learned to love the african blood in my veins because of the struggle of the kenya land freedom army which only white people and ignorant black people call the mau mau which liberated kenya and led to the independence of much of Africa. And the guerrilla struggle was led by the brother that he's named after, Daydan Kamati. But you both made very generous remarks about me and my work, uh, which I don't believe I deserve, but I'm grateful for them nevertheless. Hey, okay, brother. Yes, sir. Well, we, we definitely, like I said, we appreciate the, uh, you know, the feedback on it. And I'm glad that the message got to you. And, um, you know, as far as we're concerned, we hear you with your humbleness, but, um, you know, we meant what we said. So <laughs> that, that's 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 on that. But um, the reason that I'm honored that you uh, had me on the program, my main interest was to provide a platform for Peter Goldman to explain his role in the recent exoneration of two men who were falsely accused of Malcolm X's assassination. That's uh, Muhammad Abdulaziz, who was formerly known as Norman 3X Butler, and the late Khalil Islam, who was formerly known as Thomas 15X Johnson. <clears throat> The mainstream media and even the so-called progressive media have wholly ignored the foundational role that Peter played in a campaign that lasted sadly nearly half a century to firstly get these brothers out, which didn't work, 
and then to clear their name, which has worked in the case of uh, Islam and Aziz, but Islam is dead. And Aziz is an 83 year old man and he lost his wife and his family and had to live with the stain of being falsely accused all these years. And I don't even read or listen to anything about this anymore because um, I'm a journalist by trade as is Peter. And I was never as careless as these journalists are right now in framing the exoneration of these two brothers. Uh, a simple Google search should lead you back to Peter Goldman and it should also lead you to Baba Zake Kondo, who's done more research on Brother Malcolm's assassination, I believe, than anyone else, who built upon Peter's work. And I felt that it was important, even though Peter doesn't, for a record to be made of how this process that took nearly a half a century leading to these brothers' names being clear it happened. And that's why I begged Peter, who tends to be camera shy, to agree to be interviewed so he can lay this out. Do you mind if I pose the first question? I, I, man, listen, <laughs> look, I'm a student tonight. I, remember what you told me in private about how you was going to be quiet? We're going to reverse that role. So, <laughs> so this is a takeover. So absolutely, you could pose the first, second, and third question because of the fact that I'm here to learn. I, I don't even, I'm not even going to pretend to know half okay. of what you brothers know. So we're going to bring uh, Peter Goldman on right now, if that's okay. Here I am. What's happening? How's it going, Peter? Uh, well, actually, for for a guy my age, uh, glad to be here. Glad to be alive. Uh, uh, let me see if I can adjust. No, that's the wrong one. Well, yeah, well, definitely. We're we're honored to have you on board, and uh, you know, again, at, at Brother Paul's uh, insistence, you know. You know, I think he made a great call in uh, insisting that uh, you come on. And, you know, it was a lot of back and forth for the folks in the in the chat and this, that's viewing us and the viewers uh, after this particular broadcast finishes. You know, but it, it was worth the uh, it's worth all the begging to get these brothers on. So definitely, uh, you know, appreciate both of you coming on. Though. Peter, I'm going to ask you a question I've, I've never asked you before. In 1973, you published what, in my opinion, is the best biography of Malcolm X, which unfortunately will probably remain so because all of the biographies that have succeeded have been vastly inferior and unfortunately have piled confusion, confusion on top of confusion. Why did you name your biography The Death and Life of Malcolm X rather than the reverse? Uh, for one thing, the book opens with the death of with the death, with the assassination, and ends with the assassination. And what I uh, what I had to add to the record at that time, which uh, uh, was insufficient. And in, in the uh, in the first edition, uh, I pretty much accepted the verdict. Uh, of the court, uh, there were there were no alternatives. Uh, there was uh, uh, the th the three men charged with the murder um, uh, have been handed off to the firm of uh, of uh, Edward Bennett Williams, famous D.C. criminal lawyer. Uh, Williams handed it down to uh, junior associates. Uh, there was no money in it, uh, therefore nothing to be gained. Um, and uh, the junior associates uh, refused to let me speak to the uh, to the th uh, to the three accused men. And. Uh, so that went on for a while. Just to go back a step, uh, I should clarify that I had, uh, I, unlike a lot of white journalists, I had admired and, in fact, loved Malcolm X during his lifetime. Uh, I had had several conversations with him. 
Uh, I have no idea whether he liked me back, but I think he respected me as a journalist. Um, and uh, when I when I when I'd see him, uh, the the interviews would typically run for a couple of hours. And in my trade, uh, if you're interviewing someone in a, in a position of leadership, either in the government or in the movement. Uh, the freedom struggle, uh, you were lucky to get a half hour. Um, so uh, uh, I think Ma I think at the very least, Malcolm thought I understood him and um, I'm happy with that. I'm grateful for that. Um, but on the assassination, I had only the uh, court record to go on. Uh, uh, it was clearly it, it was clearly typical criminal court stuff. Uh, the Nation of Islam did not provide any uh, support for legal representation for any of the three guys. Uh, they were left in the hands of courthouse lawyers who took, who in, in those days I think got a fee of something like two thousand uh, dollars a piece to uh, to represent uh, the defendants and two thousand dollars does not buy you a, a serious defense uh, unfortunately but that's what I had so I left it there and uh, Uh, that was 73. Uh, in the latter 70s, I can't give you an exact date. A couple of things happened. Uh, Mujahid Halim. Uh, well, three things happened. One, uh, Elijah Muhammad died. Uh, and uh, it is my belief backed by evidence. A lot of it's uh, supplied to me by brother Paul, uh, um, that uh, the assassination was ordered by Elijah Muhammad and carried out by uh, a special squad from the Newark Mosque of the Nation of Islam. So there was that. Uh, there was Mujahid Halim. Uh, uh, like the other two brothers, uh, converting to traditional Sunni Islam. Uh, and uh, swearing in, a, in, in an affidavit that uh, uh, brothers Aziz and Islam were, um, were innocent. Uh, and the third and trigger for my uh, going back at the case was a, a letter from uh, Muhammad Aziz, uh, then at, uh, incarcerated at Sing Sing prison in New York. And in a way he was blessed because that's the closest to New York City where a lot of his people were, his friends, uh, his uh, connections, so they could come see him. Uh, uh, he wrote me a letter, a very short letter, saying, I found your book in the prison library. Um, I don't think you got the verdict right. Um, is there any chance you could come and see me? And uh, I left at the the chance. Uh, uh, and I had the first of uh, several sit downs with him at Sing Sing. Uh, and in that first sit down, he told me the story of the degree to which uh, the Nation of Islam had been involved in the assassination. Uh, that he and Johnson Islam had not been involved. Uh, uh, 
he told me at one point that if he had been ordered to uh, be involved, he probably would have uh, because he was a loyal soldier uh, in the nation of Islam and the fruit of Islam. And uh, uh, and he, Paul, should I tell the story of E2's visit? That's a, that's a keeper in yeah. the worst way. I'm going to have to use a bad word to tell it, but hey. that's, that's the only way to tell it. Right. Uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad's son, Elijah Jr., I guess, or Elijah II, uh, as Paul has informed me, was known in the Nation of Islam as E2, came to New York in the summer of 64. Uh, all the captains of the Fruit of Islam, the Fruit of Islam is the paramilitary group, uh, paramilitary arm of the Nation of Islam. I think, if, Paul, correct me if I'm wrong, but all male members of the nation were considered to be Fruit of Islam, but there was a sort of paramilitary arm of, of that. Um, uh, the captains of the Fruit of Islam from mosques all around the country were assembled in, uh, in New York. And Elijah Jr. E2 uh, spoke to them. Um, and uh, this was at a point when a house in Queens that had been given to Malcolm by Elijah Muhammad was in dispute. The Nation of Islam was trying to get it back, trying to uh, uh, evict uh, Malcolm. And uh, so E2 tells the assembled uh, captains uh, that they were slacking on the job. And he said, what you need to do is go out to that house, clap on the walls till the walls come tumbling down, go in that house, cut the nigger's tongue out, put it in an envelope, give it to me, and I'll, I'll, I'll deliver it to my father. I'll stamp it. And deliver it to my I'll, father. I'll, I'll stamp it and uh, and give it to my father. Um, so that was that was Aziz telling me two things: uh, one that this indeed came from this the order for the assassination. Uh, uh, came from on high to that uh, uh, the responsibility for executing the assassination uh, was in uh, uh, was was going to be in the hands of uh, other mosques. Uh, Paul has informed me that that was typical of uh, of uh, Nation of Islam acts of vengeance. Uh, uh, never from the home mosque uh, uh, gets uh, get another mosque to do the hit. So, so just like uh, the mob, just like the mafia, just like the mafia, exactly. He's out of town. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Well, in a lot of cases, um, uh, the uh, the John Gotti hit was organized by organized and executed by locals. Uh, uh, <laughs> which is off the subject. Um, so I, 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 in that conversation and in, in several more um, visits to Sing Sing and in a lot of 
phone conversations, prisoners were allowed to make a list of um, people they uh, called collect. They had to have the permission to of the of the person uh, they wanted to call, uh, which I obviously gave him. Uh, and um, so we talked a lot. We exchanged letters. I visited when I could. Um, um, and I also interviewed uh, Halim and Islam. Um, Halim was very open with me. Uh, uh, I got, I, <laughs> I never thought I'd uh, be fond of someone accused of the murder of Malcolm X, but I, uh, but I did get fond of him. Johnson was another story. Johnson was a much more street guy um, and very guarded about uh, opening up. Uh, he was he was the toughest interview in the in the whole period I was uh, uh, working on the case. And I talked to a lot of other people. I talked to uh, uh, Nuruddin Faiz, who was the uh, the uh, Islam who. Uh, um, led all three of these brothers um, uh, to Sunni Islam. I talked to Wallace Muhammad, who had moved, who had inherited leadership of what had been the nation of Islam and had, and himself had embraced, embraced uh, uh, Sunni Islam. Um, talked to everybody I could who, uh, and um, by volume two, I had concluded that uh, uh, these these two guys were innocent, um, Aziz and Islam. And uh, and my hair was on fire about it. It struck me as a terrible miscarriage of justice. Um, I uh, I wrote a piece in Newsweek about it. I wrote a piece in the Sunday Times, Sunday New York Times Magazine about it. I ghost wrote uh, stories under uh, uh, Mujahid's byline. Uh, 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 saw that he got whatever whatever money those stories made. They they circulated to a number of papers in uh, uh, around the country, and I, much as I hate the broadcast media, I agreed to uh, uh, appear on anyone <laughs> any show that asked me. And uh, and I consulted with Mike Wallace on a 60 Minutes piece, uh, did a panel with Mike, uh, who was uh, whose hair was also on fire about this. Uh, long story, it was a gross miscarriage of justice and uh, uh, and all that work in the 70s uh, uh, led and into the early 80s uh, got no results, um, got no positive results. I made a couple of friendships, uh, particularly with uh, Aziz. Uh, um, so the story goes cold. There are some. There are some more documentaries about uh, Malcolm and uh, and the case. And I either consulted or appeared briefly on them again without without effect. Uh,
2001, I'm sorry, 2009, I think it was, with, with help from Brother Paul. Uh, and I do regard Paul as a brother. I regard him as a blood brother. Um, uh, I took yet another look at the case. Paul supplied me with a ton of material uh, to help out. I had I scratched up some of my own and uh, published the third edition of the book. Um, again, no positive outcome. Um, so what finally, <laughs> Paul thinks I played a heroic role. I, I, just, I, I just played a persistent role. Uh, finally, what uh, tipped it, uh, what tipped the balance of the scales of justice, so-called. Um, a really, I thought, mediocre documentary on Netflix, documentary series on Netflix. Uh, I had uh, I had consulted with them, but was abashed that my name was listed, uh, that I got a credit at the end of the, fortunately in very small type, so they could, I, I doubt anyone noticed it except me. Um, but that, uh, that got Malcolm and the case back in the mainstream media news because there were there was some ex public excitement about the documentary and i think that's what tipped the scales in the new york district attorney's office um, uh, uh, elected officials always know which way the breeze is blowing and uh, the breeze was blowing uh, in the right direction for the first time in 40 or 50 years. Uh, and I'd been working with the Innocence Project, uh, which provided uh, the lawyers. Uh, I, I worked for two years with them. Uh, they had provided the, the serious legal help that uh, uh, brought the case to justice. And uh, and so it happened, it happened, it happened, uh, finally. Too late for Islam, as Paul noted, he was dead. Um, uh, Mujahid's life was essentially over. Uh, uh, he, he's still around, but... Um, uh, his life was destroyed, essentially. And uh, Aziz, my friend, uh, lived to tell, tell the tale. Um, uh, given issues of age, I couldn't go to the uh, actual event. Uh, I've, I've seen a uh, uh, streaming record of it, so I feel I, I was there. But that night, uh, there was a celebration at a, at a, rest, a Lebanese restaurant in, the, in New York. Um, uh, <laughs> I went there, uh, discovered the, the the gathering of the lawyers and Aziz and his new wife, who was much younger than uh, than Aziz, um, uh, were all in a private party room upstairs. Again, as a matter of age, I couldn't I couldn't manage the stairs, so they brought Aziz down to see me and we exchanged bro hugs, uh, several bro hugs and uh, uh, a lot of expressions of love. And uh, uh, 
He told me his reaction was half joy that the stain had been removed from his name after all these decades. And he was half bitter that so much of his life had been lost. Um, he and I were sort of at the front edge of middle age when we met. And now we were two old men exchanging bro hugs. Um, and so it was a bittersweet moment for me too. But it was uh, on balance a, happy, a, a very happy ending for me after 40 plus years working on this thing and feeling uh, the struggle was in vain for so long. And that's my story and I'm sticking to it. <laughs> Hey man, we 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 we're, we're over here. Um, I mean, you just came out the gate swinging. I mean, we didn't have to, you know, you went right to it. Um, so it, it's like uh, for me, it's it's so many emotions just in one. You know what I mean? In in, in one answer. Um, I want to ask because of the fact that I know people want to know. It's like, what uh, in particular were there any? Um, uh, give us some examples of of what came to you that that, that made you say, "Look, I, I I believe that these guys are innocent." You know what I mean? I mean, was it just, you know, they had a good story, or or, or I mean, tell us about that because of the fact that, you know, I mean, how how did that happen? How did you come to that uh, particular realization or, or thought process? Well, as I mentioned, uh, it. Um... Uh, Mujahid Halim, uh, Talmud Fair had, uh, had, uh, signed an affidavit saying I was involved. These other two guys weren't, um, uh, a journalist is going to look at that, um, uh, uh, with a grain of salt, uh, Mujahid had tried to get them off in, during the trial, but he wouldn't say who was responsible. Uh, uh, Islam in a back room uh, verbally beat up on him, uh, at least get us out. Uh, uh, and he wouldn't do it. He was, uh, he was, uh, uh, probably half out of belief and half out of fear, he was still being loyal to uh, Elijah Muhammad. And, uh, uh, and when, it, when he confessed his own culpability in court, uh, uh, he tried, he tried in a kind of halfway manner to clear the other guys it wasn't gonna work no one was going to believe him if he wouldn't name what if he wouldn't tell the whole story but what re so what really convinced me was my serial conversations with aziz um uh he's a very smart guy he um uh, he talked to me about having been a good soldier in the nation of Islam. He didn't say he had never done anything bad. Paul has informed me of a couple of specific occasions. And, uh, uh, but I just liked him. The chemistry, the chemistry was good from the first, uh, from my first visit to him in Sing Sing. Uh, 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 I spent my life as a journalist and you try to avoid uh, uh, believing at first sight. Uh, you, you, you do some mental calculations. Why is this guy saying this? Why is he saying that? Uh, I went through that process in my head and I still liked him and I still believed him. Uh, 
uh, very decent guy. And he, um, when I saw him the other night, uh, he he talked about Halim and uh, his failure to uh, tell the whole story during the trial and. Uh, and uh, as he's told me, Mujahid has an innocent heart. And I was very moved by that. Very moved by that. That's, that's a forgiving man. So um, there, there's been... Uh reports uh the new york times in particular said that the shotgun used was never recovered what's the uh um, you know anything about that or have you heard anything on that in your i don't remember i just don't remember uh it's probable you know um you do a you do an assassination in front of a crowd variously estimated at 200 to 400 and it's chaos it's chaos. Uh, the uh, the prosecution presented seven eyewitnesses out of that crowd, uh, uh, and even in the first uh, in the first edition of my book, I I raised a little a little suspicion about a couple of them. Uh, one of them was a suspect in the burning of the. Uh, the New York Mosque, Temple Number no. Seven Mosque, uh, and uh, I suspected I couldn't prove that th that was used as leverage against them. Um, uh, so, Hayer Halim was shot at the scene, so he was captured at the scene. The other two guys, or the other four guys. Uh, got away, uh, and uh, and uh, the guns went with them. Uh, in a mob scene, you can even a shotgun. You can put it. It was winter. A shotgun you can put under a heavy winter coat, and nobody's gonna uh, nobody's gonna stop and frisk you. Everyone's sort of in a state of hysteria. Uh, uh, so, yeah, I don't specifically remember that the shotgun disappeared, but I'm, I'm pretty sure it did and that it got disappeared by the, uh, by the guilty man. Mm -hmm. You, uh, have anything you want to, uh, pose, Paul? Peter, you said that, uh, Elijah Muhammad Jr. E2 addressed the fruit of Islam. Right. Um, in what capacity was he acting in order to be able to do that? Uh, there could only be one capacity, and that was orders from his father. Uh, his father uh, was very impatient to get this done. There were multiple attempts. Um, uh, you'll recall the number of attempts better than I do. Uh, uh, mostly thwarted by police. Uh, uh, there was a chase along. There was one chase. Uh, uh, through uh, along uh, Los Angeles freeways, uh, uh, NOI member, Fruit of Islam members uh, chasing, chasing Malcolm's car, didn't catch him. Another chase through the loop in Chicago. Uh, uh, and uh, and uh, several other attempts i think if I'm, check me if i'm wrong paul but i think i think you counted six forgive me for uh you may have noticed brother kalanji i'm shaking my head and covering my eyes 
This is like my least favorite. <sighs> this is like my least favorite subject. Yeah, man. Peter mentioned that. Peter mentioned that last the third edition of his book. It wasn't two thousand nine. It was two thousand thirteen. Was it? Thank Peter, you, Peter. Peter said that he hired me to to research. What he didn't tell you is that I didn't. I didn't finish. This is just too ugly. I, I, I can I about out. I can finish that for Paul. Um, uh, he uh, he's, he supplied me with critical chunks of evidence. He had to space them out for his own sanity, really. Uh, um, and finally had to stop. Uh, and I was very aware of the pain it was causing him. And he thinks he, he thinks he quit on me. I think he, uh, uh, I think he sealed the case with with what he sent me with the with the 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 the, rec, the undeniable record of uh, the implication of uh, Elijah Muhammad and his his family and his command group in uh, Chicago. Um, um, That that version of the book, Paul is the hero. Kalanja, I need to explain something. Um, I've been studying Malcolm X's life for nearly a half century. I, I wanted and you to say that. I'm sorry, but go ahead. Yeah, I said I I've been studying. You. Yeah, for nearly a half century. Started in 1974. And uh, why I am obligated as an historian to study his assassination, I've mostly done it to assist others, uh, existed first Bob Zaki Kondo, who, as I mentioned to you, has done more research than anyone else <clears throat> to build on the foundation that Peter laid. He wrote a brilliant book called Conspiracies Unwrapping the Assassination of Malcolm X, which I would urge everybody to get. And then I assisted Peter. But the majority of my investment has been in studying his life. And that's why dealing with his death. I'm sorry. Oh, no, I mean that's, that's one of my that's, uh, one of my big brothers was uh, the late Pan Africanist leader Kwame Ture, who only white people and ignorant black people called by his slave name. Stokely Carmichael, despite the fact they changed it in 1968. And uh, we were talking about Malcolm X once, and he said the worst crime of white supremacy was assassinating Brother Malcolm. Kwame had a acute sense of history, so I wanted to know what he meant by that. And he said, it decapitated. <laughs> he said it decapitated the movement. <laughs> he said, no. People like me were beginning to turn toward him. And he said they lacked the maturity. Most of them were in their early or mid 20s. And he said the confluence of somebody with the maturity and global perspective of Malcolm and the generation that later ended up demanding black power was what made his removal so catastrophic. And uh, had Malcolm X's travel journals or diaries been properly edited by someone who was grounded in the histories and cultures of the nations that he visited. If that had been properly edited, most people would understand the enormity of his loss. But unfortunately, the editors left undescribed, unexplicated, literally hundreds of references to people and institutions and organizations, and places, issues, ideas. 
had it been properly edited, placing him within the context of after Malcolm was ousted from the nation of Islam, he lived 11 months. Just over half was spent outside the United States. So that means every study of Malcolm X that's been done, including with all the respect Peters, has a giant gap in it. And travel journals would fill in that gap. And if they had been properly edited, Malcolm X would immediately be installed as the third greatest Pan-Africans of the 20th century. You would have had Marcus Garvey, Osage Fo, or Redeemer, Dr. Kwame Nkrumah, and then Malcolm. It's absolutely astonishing, if you understand those journals in context, how much he was able to accomplish, especially in that last 18-week tour abroad. He did more to begin to tie together the strands of what Marcus Garvey used to call the scatter in Africa than anybody since Marcus Garvey in a few months. Hmm. But if you don't know who he's talking to and where he's going, what parties and organizations, institutions he's interacting with, it doesn't make any sense. And no good use has been made that I'm aware of of those diaries because they were so ineptly edited. People recognize a few names, a few places, but it is the job of an editor to fully abdicate all references to persons, places, and things that would be unfamiliar to the reader. And that, there's a whole discipline behind that. It's called scholarly or documentary editing. And that's who usually something like that would be handed to, not just a writer or an enthusiast. Um, but I spent seven years without the journals before they were made available, tracking him abroad. I had to learn the rudiments of nine languages hmm. to be able to track them in foreign newspapers and magazines. I had to train myself in how to properly interpret intelligence documents from the Central Intelligence Agency and the State Department, and CIA. And I was blessed to travel abroad and meet many of the people that he had worked with. And one conversation changed my whole perspective on him it was with the Jamaican born Afro Cuban nationalist Carlos Moore who worked with Malcolm X in Paris to found the French chapter of the Organization of Afro-American Unity, Malcolm X's, the, the uh, secular Pan-Africanist organization that Malcolm formed after being ousted from the nation of Islam. And Carlos helped me to understand Malcolm X as a global figure, a man of international stature and influence, because he was assisting Malcolm on a secret project that Carlos has been the only one to write about with any depth. It was called the Afro-American Brigade. In the spring of 1964, the uh, second or third Congo crisis erupted in the former Belgian Congo. And the CIA had installed a puppet leader named Moise Chombe. And they supported him with CIA-backed anti-Castro Cuban pilots and helped him hire South African mercenaries. We're talking about white South African mercenaries who hated everything black to be able to keep him in power and be able to put down a rebellion. And while Malcolm was in Egypt in uh, September 1964, he wrote a telegram to Jalo Telly, who was the Administrative Secretary General of the Organization of African Unity. The OAU was then Africa's loose continental federation, it's now called the African Union. And he offered to Jalo Telly to raise a brigade of Afro-American veterans, as he said, skilled in all the modern methods of warfare to fight against Moise Chombe in the Congo and in support of the freedom fighters. And I remember when I read that, I thought that was brilliant rhetoric, but I didn't think anything more of that until I met Carlos Moore. And Carlos Moore told me in great detail how he was organizing that brigade. That it's a whole different Malcolm X that we've been taught because that means he's internet he's interfering or proposing to interfere in international geopolitics and Carlos believes that this is part of the reason that he was banned from entering France on February 9th 1965 12 days before he was assassinated and as I said I spent seven years just reconstructing his tours abroad and Subsequently, that I further immersed myself, as I said, in the histories and cultures of every nation that he visited and many that he did not visit, and was able to put him in context. And that's why talking about and writing about
His assassination is so painful because he was killed for the most parochial reasons. The amazing work that he was doing, knitting together the black world. The ingenious work that he was doing in his last months to be able to unite the southern and northern wings of the movement. The fact that grassroots leaders all over the country were beginning to be attracted to him and to organize. The fact that he was making friends in the Muslim world for us. The fact that he had planned a tour of the Caribbean and that the OAU, OAU had chapters in London and in Paris, Cairo, Nairobi, Kenya, Dar es Salaam, Tanzania, and he was getting calls from Nova Scotia and Canada. Nothing since the Garvin movement like that had happened. And he gets slaughtered uh, because some old man objected to him outing his sex life. Mm -hmm. Wow. I was working for Spike Lee in 1991 as his historical consultant. And I handled what Spike called the salami salami below the desk. You got to have gray hair like mine to know that that's what Popeye called Muslim salami salami baloney. So Muslims were calling Spike's office trying to get money and to tell what they knew. And one particular cat called and he gave me one of these ridiculously long, pretentious Muslim names that I quickly ignored. I said, what was your name in 1964-65? And he told me. I said, you were lieutenant of Ma such and such. And he was surprised that he was talking to somebody who knew his history because he had been involved. He had been complicit in one of the attempts on Malcolm X's life. And uh, I asked him, the nation of Islam kill Malcolm? And he was insulted by the question. And forgive my language. And he said, that nigga got in the way of our money. He wasn't the first person that I talked to that was complicit in the assassination or attempts on it, who had the exact same attitude of contempt. And it, Peter has been working on a, a, the latest installment of a series of novels, and he's dealing with the mafia. And Peter and I have had long discussions about what he's discovering, and I find it chilling the comparisons between mob culture and the culture of the nation of Islam in this regard. Hmm. Wow. Man. Uh, I, I, you know, my one regret about this whole adventure is that I didn't meet Paul until after the first edition was published. And uh, Paul and his brother uh, Sunni Khalid uh, came to visit me at my office in Newsweek. And uh, Paul was relatively a kid at the time, but I had the feeling then that he knew more than I did. <laughs> and uh, uh, it was too late to partner up with him. <laughs> Uh, I wish I wish I had known Paul when I started, uh, rather than after the first edition. Uh, well, Peter, I just thank you for being so, so generous. I'm not being generous. I'm being factual. No, I mean being so generous to me ever since then. You've been uh, more than a friend more than a mentor, as you said, like a blood brother. And uh, I want to thank you publicly for the death and life of Malcolm X. That book inaugurated what could be called Malcolm X Studies. And I want to thank you for the work that you did to free Khalil Islam and Muhammad Aziz and Billy Met to clear their names. I want to thank you for working with Mujahid Halim, formerly Tom Jax Clare, Hayer, to finally tell the truth of what happened. And I want to thank you for the integrity that you bring to everything that you do. And this is why I wanted you on this program, because this is a great story. And I don't understand what the point of the Netflix series was. They chose uh, essentially an amateur historian as a narrative device. Right. Well, the reason that I refused to participate in the program is because I said it should center on the work that you and Baba Zach Kondo did. That, in my opinion, is a great story that two men would devote much of their lives at great cost to trying to free or exonerate two innocent men. And they chose this silly 
pet detective approach. I don't understand. <laughs> That's an exact description. <laughs> pet detective. Um, I, I, and, I, and I don't mean that, you know, the people involved in it weren't sincere, well, meaning it was a creative choice. But you've just heard Peter Goldman tell his story, and you've heard me talk about Baba Zakondo. Is that not a good story? Without a doubt. Absolutely. Absolutely. But but speaking of that, on, on that on that uh, note, I know that, um, you know, I think that part of and you correct me if I'm wrong, uh, Paul, I think that part of uh, the, the emotions behind this as well is the fact that uh, you became friends and close with the family, correct? The family yeah. of Malcolm. OK, yeah. OK. I've, I was blessed to be close to Malcolm's family, including his mother and all of his inner circles, amazingly. And the Nation of Islam and the Muslim Muslims Incorporated and the Organization of African American Union and, and even his crew on the streets of Harlem in the 1940s. So uh, I don't understand why people opened up to me or trusted me in the way that they did. But you make a very good point. I don't like to talk about it, but that makes it more painful. Uh, because I've had a chance to see how his assassination affected his blood and his co-workers, his comrades and his friends. And you, you said his mother because of the fact that the thing is, um, unfortunately, when we look at uh, uh, Spike's version and we just look out, period, it's like uh, his mother, you know, goes into this. She has this health crisis and we hear no more about it. Can can you I mean, I know that, you know, we, we, what we're sending it around, but I think that's very important because of the fact that I haven't heard anyone ever say anything about about his mother so i mean she lived how much longer than malcolm i mean because of the fact that this is something that quite, quite a bit i think it was until the late 19 later early 1990s i don't remember the, the exact date wow. and uh, i can't claim any credit for this uh i would show uh at that time 16 millimeter movies of malcolm x to the family and uh one day <clears throat> After one of the screenings, I was I used the restroom and I was walking down the hallway and I looked to my left and there was this old woman sitting in a wheelchair. And she looked up at me and raised both of her hands like this in a gesture as if she wanted to shake my hand. I had no idea who she was because nobody told me that Malcolm's mother was there. So I walked over to her tenderly and handed her my hand and she clasped my one hand between both of hers and motioned for me to sit on the bed next to her. And First time she spoke, it occurred to me where she was from because she had this lilting accent from Grenada. And she said, you look like my son. And uh, one, of Malcolm's sis one of Malcolm X's sisters walked in with a look of alarm on her face because Malcolm X's mother was not known to open up to strangers. As a matter of fact, she didn't even open up to all the family members. And uh, the sister asked her mother, which which son, mama, which son does he look like? And as far as I could tell, uh, Grandma Little, as she was called, ignored her and just kept looking at me. And every time I saw her after that, she would start telling me, she would tell me stories unasked. I never asked her a single question. And I remember every word that she said because she, she was a very literate woman, as you probably know, spoke several languages. But more than that, she had the kind of intelligence that's visceral I don't know if this is, I don't know, perhaps you haven't met anybody like that. Malcolm X's mother had his intelligence that you could feel hmm. that left a mark. Absolutely. So I remember everything that she said. And the stories that she would tell me were so vivid that it was almost like I would become part of the story. Or I could look around and see, think, this, I'm sorry if this sounds metaphysical to you, that's the way that I no, experienced it. No, it's cool. It. I got you. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, forgive me for not sharing the content, that's private. That's no, cool. You can imagine, after listening to her stories and getting to know her, I'm, I'm dealing with her son and her son's, uh, you know, the brutal way that he's murdered. So I wouldn't mention it had you not mentioned it, but yeah, that's, that's, uh, that's one of the reasons that this, this, this gets tougher, because I'm looking at the woman who gave birth to him. Sure. This is, this is, uh, Man, I, I am like, uh, 
you know, again, this is a learning experience um, to the people in the chat and, and those viewing. Uh, definitely, we are grateful to have uh, Brother Paul Lee and Brother Peter Goldman in the building tonight. This is it's an honor. I, I was trying to get either one of them on and we end up with both. And, and it's just like uh, <laughs> I, I almost wish I could share the emails because these guys are like, I mean, it, it was it, it, I, I've never seen two people out praise each other. You know? <laughs> like, he's the greatest. No, oh, actually, he's the greatest. This is the best person for the job. No, he's the greatest person for the job. Well, you should interview him. We should interview him. So I, I had to like literally call Peter Goldman like, hey, look, man, you know, is Kalanji begging again. Uh, you know, I know you've been a journalist. She was at Newsweek for over 40 years. And I'm sure that you ran into some obstacles, so on and so forth. He laughed and he said he'd do it if Paul agreed to do it. And, uh, you know, Paul, <laughs> he, he was tough down to uh, this morning. So, uh, you know, we've, I definitely appreciate, you know, both of you uh, coming on. Brother, I'd like to ask you a favor. Yes, sir. Never have me talk about this again. Right on. That's Paul. That's Paul. As long as I've known him, uh, and um, because because of my work, I've had to. I, I felt obliged to force this subject on him from time to time, but uh, never again. Uh, We've got the happy, the as close to a happy ending as we're going to get. Uh, I'll never ask you another question on this subject. Hey, listen, what 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 we have is 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 time capsule material. Um, I, I want to ask uh, you, Peter, because of the fact that most folks and and, and Paul, I I appreciate it through through the emotions, and I can imagine you know you've done far more work on uh El Haj Malik Shabazz on Malcolm uh than I ever could and I'm always emotional when anyone ever has anything lopsided to say about them and I haven't done half the research you have so definitely um you know we're, we're honored by that um but Peter I, I know that you know I've, I've spoken to several people and and um it's been said that it's possible that you were amongst, if not uh, the last person to interview Malcolm. Um, I don't know if that's correct or not, but um, could you no, it, no, it's 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 uh, not. I uh, uh, there was a Philadelphia journalist who named Paul Lee. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, Paul. Uh, named uh, Clyde, Cla uh, Claude, Claude Lewis. I'm sorry. My again, my memory plays tricks. Claude Lewis uh, interviewed him very late. I think probably in December. December twenty third, sixty four. Christmas Eve, Eve. Wow. Yeah. Great interview. At a, at a which, yeah. which you used to great effect and. The death and life of Malcolm X. Yeah, it was precious. It was precious, and I, I had known Paul when I started at Newsweek. There was no black staff, no black editorial staff, and the only person who was close to that was was Claude, and he was sitting in in those. This was pre computer, pre internet days. He was sitting in. Uh, a wire room tapping my stories and everyone else's stories into a teletype setter. Uh, and a couple of our sports writers would sneak him actual uh, reporter assignments uh, uh, just to acknowledge his existence and that he wasn't a, his aspiration wasn't to be a typist of other people's copy. Um, and uh, uh, Claude later uh, became a columnist with one of the Philadelphia papers. I forget. I always forget which one. There were three. Inquirer. 
was it the Enquirer? Thanks. Oh. Um, and uh, so he and I met at uh, at Chalk Full of Nuts. That, if you know New York, that's a that's a chain sort of burger and coffee uh, place. Um, was a favorite of Malcolm's in Harlem. It was near the Teresa, I believe. Uh, and so I, I met Claude It's on the there. first floor of the Teresa, actually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, I met Claude there, and he gave me a typescript of the, uh, of the uh, interview. Um, we had be he and I had become friends. Uh, and uh, there was an even later, wasn't it the Columbia Spectator, wasn't there a... a you talking about the report on him the, uh, on his last speech at Barnard College on February 18th, 65? Yeah. That yeah. was a report, but not an interview. Were, were there other interviews after Claude? But, yeah. There were, oh, yeah. There, there were many. The last interview that I'm aware of was an actual written interview, uh, Said Ramadan, who is the director general of the Islamic Center in Geneva, Switzerland, wrote Malcolm X a series of questions. And as you know, the night before Malcolm was assassinated, uh, he stayed at the New York Hilton, which you've written about in The Death of Life of Malcolm X. And Malcolm X stayed up that night answering those questions. And they have since been published in several collections, including mm -hmm. a book called February 1965, The Final Speeches. Uh, the first time it was published was for, by the journal of this Islamic Center, but then the Muslim Students Association in the United States, the MSA, published it as a little pamphlet. But as far as I'm aware, that's the last interview right. with Malcolm X. Yeah. The last broadcast interview was February 18th, 1965. You remember he was on contact on WINS with Stan Bernard. I that's do. the last I radio do. interview. I do. Last. <clears throat> I do now remember the thanks to you reminding me. Yeah. So, so what was he like with you? I know you said uh, you you thought that he trusted you, uh, or or that you understood him. So, I mean, what what was the setting? I mean, you know, give give us some of that because of the fact that you not hit us with so much. I mean, we we have to, as Paul said, visualize and and you know take us there. What was the, what's the environment, the climate? You know, when when you last interviewed him or. When I last interviewed him, it was in the basement of, uh, I'm going to mangle the name of the bookstore, the African... National Memorial African Bookstore. The, thank you. Uh, uh, owned by uh, a, uh, a long, uh, an elderly and longtime nationalist, uh, Louis... Uh, Michaud, uh, sometimes pronounced Michaud. Um, in Harlem? Uh, in Harlem, yeah. Uh, it was, uh, we, had a, I, we sat in the basement of, uh, of the bookstore uh, among mounds of unshelved books and uh, and there were pictures of black heroes along the up, upper part of the wall. And among them was General Douglas MacArthur, which I never <laughs> figured out. <laughs> maybe, maybe the professor knew something I didn't know. <laughs> it's possible. Um, and... Uh, uh, And we, it, it was the day he had uh, formally, uh, he had done his press conference formal, formalizing his break with the Nation of Islam. March 12th, 1964. Thank you. At the Park Definitely. Sheraton Hotel. Uh, and uh, And we and we talked for a couple of hours. Um, um, it 
it kills me to this day that uh, in the sh in the shuffle of various moves, I lost all my interview my own interview notes with Malcolm, uh, except scrawled notes of my first, which was in St. Louis, where I worked at the time. I worked on a St. Louis newspaper, and uh, I had read. Uh, Sierra Lincoln's book about the nation of Islam. And, and uh, when I was halfway through it, Malcolm appeared at a, at a, uh, an event, uh, the Harvard Law School. I was at, I had a one year fellowship at Harvard and. Uh, uh, March 23rd, 1961, the Harvard Law School for Harvard. Yeah. And, uh, uh i was 1961 yeah yeah 61 would be right yeah uh snowy night uh i was stunned by his force uh the force of his speech and the what even then as a conventional white liberal, I couldn't argue with. Uh, uh, and uh, so I got back to my job in St. Louis and I persuade my city editor to let me do a series on the local uh, mosque of the Nation of Islam uh which i did it was it, it was not one of their strong <laughs> i'm putting this i'm putting this gently. it was not one of their strongest mosques minister clyde rahman yeah right and william caldwell was the uh captain uh uh a post office worker um and uh so I did. I did a series about you know what what their beliefs were, and uh, uh, and uh, uh, a couple three months later, I'm sitting in the newsroom of the St. Louis Globe Democrat, and I got a call. Pick it up. Uh, uh, Hello, Mr. Goldman. This is Minister Malcolm X. Uh, I'm going to be in St. Louis uh, visiting the local mosque. Uh, would you like to? Would you like to see me? And I, I think I bumped my head on the ceiling, <laughs> leaping at the chance, and. Uh, so that was my first get together and the only one in which I uh, still had notes and the notes are raggedy because in those days, newspapermen commonly folded copy paper into three so it would fit into an inside jacket pocket. And I scribbled notes on that and uh, they're not very coherent. Um, the notes on my subsequent uh, interviews with him, uh, uh, I I got to type, uh, but uh, at the time I never imagined I'd be writing a book about him, and uh, and uh, journalists. If they stack up all the paper they accumulate uh, within a week, they they would be invisible behind their desks. <laughs> and, uh, so, I guess I I don't specifically know, but I guess that when it, those notes uh, disappeared in a routine house cleaning. Brother uh, Kalanji, if you're interested in that the interview that. Peter said he did it. Professor, he talked about Louis, Louis Michaud. He called yes. himself the professor because he professed. Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. ER. Yeah. 
But the yes. interview with yeah. Professor Michel that was conducted on March 12, 1964 can be found in Newsweek magazine for March 23rd, 1964. Unfortunately, it's not available online, but a university library or a better public library would have it. But I highly recommend it because as usual, Peter's representation of that epical period of Malcolm's life is exceedingly fair. Uh, hey, I, I got a friend named um, and, and a new mentor named uh, Brother Paul Lee, and I'm sure that he might find it in his heart and in his spirit. If he runs across <laughs> it and happen to be able to hit that email, you know what I'm saying? I mean, he might do it for a brother. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> Peter didn't mention uh, that he had uh, lunch with Malcolm X at the uh, restaurant at the St. Louis Mosque called the Shabazz Frosty Cream. Mm. And it's interesting because Peter didn't mention who was there with him. So, so, so uh, Peter, you holding back on this, brother? What's going yeah, on, man? Back on you. No, I didn't mean to hold back. You, you give me the basic interview, huh? I see how we do this thing. This supposed to be uh, Ryan started TV, man. I did all that begging, and this all I'm getting. <laughs> well, let me bust. Uh, let me I bust. Brother, let me but let me bust brother Peter out. He was there with Helen Dudar, and uh, when I first met him, I I said to him, if I recall correctly, uh, Mr. Helen Dudar, I presume, his <laughs> wife. And that's and I gratefully is. accepted that yeah. she was way more talented than yeah. the late Helen. Yeah, Duda, uh, the late was, Helen Duda is the best writer that he, for journalists and writers from the 1950s to the 1980s, she was widely considered to be the best practitioner of her craft. Mm -hmm. I personally don't know anyone as good, let alone better. What I don't understand is how a woman of these transcendent gifts ended up marrying Peter Goldman. But, <laughs> I fell in love with her as well. <laughs> and, you and talk about references. And, I'm sorry, please. And, and part of all the usual other attractions of a woman was her was her skill as a writer. She uh, wrote a four her, part series on black insight, national. I'm sorry. She started me toward a belief that women see uh, women journalists see things that men don't see. Uh, uh, and I've carried that with me all my life. I've uh, I've worked with a lot of women journalists, and I, on balance, came to prefer uh, them to men journalists. Uh, uh, they see third dimensions uh, that uh, I. Helen and I met covering a murder trial in Boston. Uh, I was working in St. Louis. She was working in New York. The trial was in Boston. Uh, it was a juicy sex and death uh, trial. And it lasted for five or six weeks. So we had time to get a a romance started and uh, on my way back to St. Louis, I stopped in New York for a few days and I was sitting in her apartment when uh, the post sent her, sent a manila envelope full of her clips on the trial. She didn't want to look at them. She was always, she didn't, never looked back. Uh, so I started reading them and she and I had covered the same trial and I read and read, and I said first to myself and then to her, so that's what this trial was about. <laughs> uh, and I meant it. It was totally true. She, she, uh, she saw the innards. Uh, and... Uh, and when we uh, when we had that sit down at the Shabazz Frosty Cream, uh, uh, as we were as we were all leaving, uh, uh, she said to Malcolm, as a joke, "Well, you're preaching developing black businesses uh, uh, as." part of the liberation of, of, of black Americans. What if they all succeed and join the NAACP? And Malcolm for a moment didn't 
know she was joking. <laughs> and then he began that magical smile and laugh. Uh, but it, took, it was a slow take. Uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, I, I just loved the guy. Uh, I couldn't help it. You're not supposed, journalists are not supposed to fall in love with the subjects, but uh, I did. Brother Colonti, let me give you another reference. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I told you Newsweek, as far as I know, is not available online, unfortunately. Uh, no. no none, of the, none of these newspaper web, websites like newspapers.com have bothered to put the New York Post where Helen worked online. I don't understand that. But in April of 1964, she did a multi-part series on black nationalism, which was one of the best things ever done. And I've been a student. First of all, I'm a nationalist my whole life. But I've been a student of it for nearly half century. And the only, I think the only scholar that I've ever seen cited is her husband mm -hmm. in The Death and Life of Malcolm X. But she didn't just interview Malcolm, but she interviewed his contemporaries of different philosophical streams. So she talked to Milton Glamison, who had organized two school boycotts in New York. She interviewed Jim Farmer, the executive, uh, the national director or whatever, the, of the Congress Racial Equality or CORE. And the thing that I found amusing, and I'm sad I never get a chance to talk to her about it, is, oh, and she interviewed Bayard Rustin, the organizer of the March on Washington. In each case, including Malcolm, she put these heavyweights back on their heels with her questions. <laughs> I told Peter that if she ever interviewed me or tried to interview me, I'd have two words for her, no comment. <laughs> <laughs> because she had an acute perception. But it's a shame that that series of hers on black nationalism as far as I'm aware, it has never been reprinted. And the only way you're going to find it is through uh, a microfilm in a university library. You probably have to go to New York. Yeah, when I uh, when she was uh, terminally ill, I, as you know, I put together a, a, a collection of, of her journalism. And... Uh, and it... The only place I could get her New York Post stuff was uh, microfilm at the Post. And then you had to know a specific date and uh, for them to find it. You couldn't ask them to go through uh, reels of microfilm. But I found enough stuff to create a, a book that I was, I was happy with. What's the title of that book, Peter? The Attentive Eye. Where is it available? Uh, only online. Uh, I had to do it. She was dying, and I had to get it out fast, so I, I took it to a, a self-publishing house, uh, uh, which can turn books around faster. It, Traditional publisher can take two or three years, unless it's, you know, the latest red hot book about Trump or something. Then they'll then they'll speed the process. But uh, um, and I I wanted to get in, get it in her hands uh, while she was alive enough to and aware enough to appreciate it. Uh, I got um, her illness was taking a bad turn, um, and I got the page proofs. Um, uh, when she was still capable of reading and and understanding stuff, and. Uh, only time in our relationship I lied to her. I said, uh, you know, people are, people send me stuff about Malcolm X and they want me to go over it. And, uh, and this is just another one of those people. Uh, uh, and then I handed her, I had gotten, Nora Afrin had been a friend of ours, and I, I handed Helen Nora's 
Nora did a short introduction. Um, and uh, and then I handed her uh, my longer introduction, which was uh, pretty much a sustained love letter. And I asked her if she wanted to look at her work. And she said, no, <laughs> she, she wouldn't revisit it. So uh, uh, that was her. Uh, but at least she knew the book, the book was going to exist. And uh, I got it in her hands when she was in hospice care. And uh, this tough stuff. Um, she knew, she knew what it was. Peter, you were married to Helen Dudar. You do know that you're the luckiest man who ever lived. Yeah, I do. I do. To this day, no competition. Hey man, I appreciate you both sharing, uh, these, uh, these moments these triumphs and and just the fact that um you know i mean you like one of the coolest cats on earth man you you and your wife kicked it with malcolm having lunch i mean <laughs> like <laughs> lunch with malcolm i mean that sounds like a, a a book alone you know yeah. what i mean so yeah I, that, I, sh I, I won't quite say lunch with Malcolm. Uh, <laughs> Helen and I had lunch. Malcolm had a cup of, cup of coffee <laughs> with, with cream. He said uh, one of his standard lines was, coffee's the only thing I like integrating. <laughs> hey, hey. No, no, no. I remember him talking about uh, if uh, when you're dining and you're sitting at it, when some other folks are dining and you're sitting at the table, you're not dining, you're just sitting at the table. So that kind of reminded me of that real quick. Well, yeah. um, yeah, yeah. Um, man, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to, again, totally grateful is, I mean, Paul, you, you're the, the man with the plan who brought it all together. Are there any more things that, that, that we should know from Peter that he holding back because of the fact that you know him better than I do. And I, I think that, uh, you know, he, he might move a little bit better coming from you. You know what I mean? I, I just started my begging tradition with him. Why don't you ask him on again? Hey, 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 listen, I'm, I'm cool with that. Peter, what, what's what's the deal with that, man? Um, we, we we doing a one-time one, one time thing, or uh, we're going to have you back on soon? If, if you think it's worth it, but I've, I've forgotten more than I knew. <laughs> but you knew more than I forgot. How about that? <laughs> <laughs> brother Kalanji, promise me that you're going to have Baba Zaki Kondo on. The brother is fabulous. The work that he did to build upon what Peter Goldman did is extraordinary. As far as I'm concerned, it's the closest thing to a last word that we're likely to have. Right on, right on. I agree, I agree. Yeah, so I would definitely reach out to him. I appreciate the contact on that. Uh, and I'm going to tell him that uh, and if I have any issues, then I'm going to uh, put both of you in the email chain and uh, we, we can do the back and forth one more time. Um, it, it, before we close, uh, I know folks want to want to know, um, are there uh, what books or publications or um, uh, or um, any type of uh, information in regards to Malcolm, they should check it out. Shout out to Dr. Jared Ball, uh, one of our, uh, our hosts and, and uh, co-owners here at Black Power Media. I know he's had Baba Zach on uh, a few times on the platform, you know, but, um, you know, it, it definitely won't hurt to, uh, you know, bring him on again. So the uh, best one, Malcolm X biography is Peter Goldman's A Death and Life of Malcolm X, the second best is Louis A. DeCaro, D-E-C-A-R-O, On the Side of My People, A Religious Life of Malcolm X. Extraordinarily well done. He had access to resources that Peter didn't. Uh, but it's not just that. Brother Lou is uh, exceedingly sincere. And uh, I believe it's the sincerity that made him open to understanding more sides of Malcolm X 
and other biographers. I would highly recommend that. Unfortunately, the best books on Malcolm X, in my opinion, have been long out of print. Uh, one is a book by Michael Abdul Malik uh, called From Michael DeFritis to Michael X. It's published in 1968. Uh, Michael DeFritis, as Michael Abdul Malik, I should say, was a Trinidadian hustler in London when Malcolm X came through a week and a half before he was assassinated. And Malcolm began to cultivate him. Then a few days later, Malcolm's killed and he emerges as a leader of the burgeoning black power movement in England, but he still had one foot, and I don't mean this in a negative sense, one foot in his depravity, because he'd been a hustler, and one foot in his divinity that Malcolm showed him, and he was trapped there. And in my personal opinion, he never resolved it, and he was hung, was executed in Trinidad 10 years later for murder. But oh, wow. his book, From Michael DeFridus to Michael X, in my personal opinion, and Peter may differ with me on this, is easily the most faithful portrait of Malcolm X ever published. And I learned about it from the uh, note on sources at the back of Peter's book. That's number one, in terms of fidelity. And I say this from somebody, as I said, who was blessed to know Malcolm X's family and all of his inner circles. And I read that account and, and it was ghost written by a white man. But it's astonishing how accurate and perceptive it is. If you want to understand Malcolm in three-dimensional terms, from Michael Tefridis to Malcolm X, uh, the second one is a book by Hakeem Jamal called From the Dead Level, Malcolm X and Me, published in 1972 or 73. He was a cousin-in-law of Malcolm X's, had been in the Nation of Islam, uh, and spent some days with Malcolm during his last visit to Los Angeles, a month before he was assassinated. And that's an interesting book because you get a chance to see the arc of Malcolm's evolution from someone who knew him in the 40s as a hustler all the way to a month before he was assassinated. Uh, our, um, there, there's some license taken, but again, if you want a three-dimensional view of Malcolm, that's a good one. The, the, the last one's going to surprise you. It's a book called uh, And Bid Him Sing by David Graham Du Bois. He was the stepson of Dr. W. E. Du Bois that came out in 72 or 73. And it's an historical novel. And uh, I understand from family friends that David's mother, Shirley Graham Du Bois, Dr. Du Bois' widow, actually complained about the book because she saw the history, but where's the novel? <laughs> he <laughs> nails the history. And it's easy to substitute the historical characters for the real people. and. Right. There's a character named Jones who's a reporter, and that's David Graham Du Bois. But this is an account of Malcolm X's three months from, this is July to September of 1964, where David Graham Du Bois helped Malcolm X form the little known Egyptian chapter of the Organization of Afro-American Unity. And it is splendid, again, in capturing the three-dimensional man. For people who know little or nothing about Malcolm X, or people who want to understand him as more than an icon, but as a flesh and blood, those are the three books that I refer them to. And unfortunately, they're all out of print. You can only find them wow. in libraries. Wow. But it, t I tell you what, it would be worth your time to go to the libraries. Uh, if you, uh, I noticed in the comments, somebody asked me about Young Carew's book. Ignore that, it's mostly made up. Hmm. And I'll give an example. I went to interview Young Carew uh, at his university in Virginia. And it was the worst interview I've ever conducted with any human being in my life. And like Peter, I'm a reporter as well as I'm a journalist, as well as a historian. And he didn't remember much of anything, it was awful. And after the interview was over, I noticed on his shelf a book on the Grenadian Revolution that I really liked. And there was one part that touched me. And it was a letter that a unnamed social worker wrote about a young Maurice Bishop and Bernard Cord. These were the two people who led the revolution in Grenada, when they were still social workers in England in the 1960s, where, the, by the way, they saw they met Malcolm X and were inspired. And I asked him, who was, I asked Mr. Carew, who was this social worker? He said, oh, I just made it up. <laughs> and then he told me, he pulled down some other books to legitimate making stuff up. He was a great <laughs> raconteur and probably a great dinner guest. But in terms of history, no. Mm -hmm. Now remember, this is a man who remembered almost nothing when I interviewed him for three hours. And then a few years later, he comes out with this book detailing his conversation with Malcolm X. I can assure you 
that most of that is made up. And even worse than that, I introduced him to Malcolm X's eldest brother, Wilford Little. And uh, if you pick up, Ludacar has a second book on Malcolm X. I forget the title of it. Christianity is in there, but I highly recommend it. He does the only, one of the few, I should say, full page end notes I've ever seen in my life, deconstructing the stuff that Jan Carew made up. Uh, Jan, uh, Jan Carew has Malcolm's brother Wilford talking about when Mar the Honorable Marcus Garvey visited the family, which was true. And he stated that there was uh, a short, he, I think he says Japanese or Oriental man with him. And uh, I asked Wilford, because of course I talked to Malcolm X's mother and talked to him, and I never heard of this short Asian man. He said, I never said anything like that. <laughs> and at another point, Jan has Wilford saying that Malcolm had a tiger boy walk. And I asked Wilford to explain to me what a tiger boy walk was. He said, I have no idea because I didn't say that. And it's a shame that I have to say these kinds of things to you. And it may come as a shock to some people, but that is not as unusual as you think. And there are people who have my supposed profession of scholar and historians who also make stuff up. Uh, and in terms of Malcolm X studies, Peter Goldman wrote in 1973 in the first edition of Death and Life of Malcolm X that he hoped that black people would fill shelves of books on Malcolm. And I guess we have and we've blown it. Because hmm. I can hardly, except for Zach Condo, I can hardly think of anything off the top of my head that I can refer to. And we've had a lot of company in doing bad books on Malcolm X. But you've had very few people who have done the actual shoe leather work. Uh, if they talked to people, they didn't know the questions to ask or if they or they didn't know how to interpret the answers. And it's, I ha have a very low opinion of much of what, even though Peter laid the groundation for Malcolm X studies, I have a very low opinion of constituting Malcolm X studies because the work is so poor and it's getting worse. I'll give you an example. I taught, uh, I'm a visiting scholar at the University of California, Berkeley's uh, Department of African American Studies. And three years ago, my department chair asked me to teach one of her classes <clears throat> on Malcolm X. And there are two biographies of Malcolm that, whose names I will not mention. And I brought a stack of books, which I knew were major sources or alleged sources for these biographies. And I handed them to the students and I said, pick a page, any page, and start reading at random. They couldn't get through a paragraph without me saying, stop, check the source. I flipped to the back of the book. I said, okay, here's the source. And I'd hand it to them. Does that fairly represent what that said? Nine times out of 10 did not. Wow. And at the end of the class, I had a trash basket next to me and I held both of these biographies over it and I dropped them in the trash. I said, that's where these belong. But most people don't have the training to check a scholar's sources. My chief mentor on scholarship was not a scholar. It was a man named George Brightman. He edited the posthumous collections of Malcolm X's speeches, writings, interviews, Malcolm X speaks, by name is necessary, Malcolm X and I from American history, two speeches by Malcolm X. and. Uh, Brightman taught me that scholarship is two things and two things only, argumentation and documentation. You have no argument if you can't back it up. Hmm. But the documentation has to be properly interpreted. Argumentation and documentation, they're twins. And most of the scholarship generally in this culture, unfortunately, does not adhere to that principle. And certainly books on Malcolm X don't. So I would urge anybody, don't take my word for it. Next time you read anything by anybody, including me, check the end notes, check the sources, and see if what they, if their assertions or claims are accurately buttressed or supported by the sources, and you will be scandalized when you find out. that There's one book, for example, that cites uh, intelligence documents, and it'll say, Malcolm X headquarters file, FBI headquarters file. Well, that's tantamount to saying it's a needle in that haystack over there. Of course, the only intelligent way to support it is to cite a precise document, not a record group. But people can get away with stuff like that because most people don't read in those. Mm -hmm. And sadly, one of the reasons that Peter Goldman has not been given the just credit that he's due for laying the foundation to free these two uh, falsely accused men and then to clear their names is at least two biographies that have come out now have represented as discoveries that uh, Muhammad Abdul Aziz and Khalil Islam were not guilty, despite the fact that Peter published since 1979. Wow. But they present these as discoveries, and Peter's name appears in the endnote, not in the text. So I'm sorry, I don't mean to end on I don't mean to end on a downer. 
Uh, but I, I've told you the books that I consider after nearly a half century reliable. And I've mentioned the best biographies being Peter Goldman's and Lou DeCarlo's. Other than that, good luck. So anyone that owns a Man and Marable book, what should they do with it? Marable interviewed me because I had, I had known Malcolm. Uh, um, and um, and uh, made, made up parts of the interview. Uh, uh, he was, uh, I told him the story of the meeting at the Shabazz Frosty Cream in St. Louis. And uh, he said Goldman was highly nervous. Uh, uh, awaiting the interview. I was highly something. I was highly excited uh, and highly anticipatory, but uh, but nervous. Now, you don't get nervous. And in my trade, you just, you know, uh, you take what kind of, I once interviewed the Grand Dragon of the Alabama Ku Klux Klan uh, in a hotel lobby and Tuscaloosa, and uh, uh, that didn't make me highly nervous either. It's part of the it's part of the trade I practice for all my working life, um, and uh, but specifically with Malcolm. Uh, My approach going into that lunch was I'm getting to know someone who's, who struck me on my one witness exposure to him as the real deal and as the beginning of my, re -edu my re education from straight hundred proof white liberalism to to an understanding of the flip side black nationalism uh black the the the, the real black struggle not not the part that was whites of good nature <laughs> helping uh the uh Poor black folks. Uh, 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 he he uh, he taught he taught me uh, a whole different perspective. Enabled me when Paul and I have talked a lot about a lot about the transition from the from the early freedom struggle uh, to black nationalism, black power, and. Uh, and Malcolm was my prep school for that. Uh, made it easier for, made it way easier for me to understand that shift and the logic underlying that shift. Uh, that actually that growth. Uh, um, so. Uh, so, Dr. Marable, wherever you're, whatever corner of heaven you're occupying now, I was not nervous. And he, and he was on, another, on a number of other places. So, uh, he, just, he just remixed everything you said, huh? Yeah, well, um, embellishing everything I said and sometimes warping. Uh, so. Brother Kalunj, I would go further though and take it beyond Malcolm X studies. As a general rule, scholars should be considered like you do lawyers. We are not to be trusted. Make us <laughs> and of course, as I said, our our craft, our discipline is based on that that two those two things, argumentation and documentation. So make us prove our word. Right. Don't ever read a book 
that first of all, don't read, don't take a book seriously if it's supposed to be in the humanities or in social studies. It does not have source notes. But if it does, then check those source notes. Don't just read it and nod your head and say, well, I assume that they did that. Because there's all kind, we got all kind of motivations, trying to get tenure, trying to be famous, trying to get rich, trying to get laid, all kinds of motivations that often have absolutely nothing to do with telling the truth, even to the extent that God may bless us to see it. I don't see a lot of honor, I'm sad to say, among people in my profession, hmm. which is why I'm not really well liked by people in my profession. But we are not to be trusted. So check our word. Don't just accept who we, and including me, don't accept anything. If I, if I can't back it up, then don't don't believe me. If I, if I don't provide sources, if I don't provide evidence, then I don't want you to believe me. I don't want you to take my word. Hmm. Uh, Malcolm X's brother, Wilfred, uh, and I were very close. Uh, and I found out after he died um, from his daughter she said that he appreciated that I didn't take his word for anything. I was stunned to hear that. She said, Paul's like a hound dog. And I'll go chase <laughs> it down. But this was a man of, in my opinion, unimpeachable rectitude. I actually did believe <laughs> Wilfred Little Shabazz when he said stuff. But I must have also checked it out. But I had no idea that he was watching me in that way. Uh, but that's what we need to do. We need to be vigilant. It is rare, in my opinion, that you have a scholar of integrity where you can just take their word for it. And uh, Brother Kamathi or Greg Carr is one of those. You should check his work, too. But if he says something, you can basically take it to the bank. And that's why I consider that brother so precious. And that's why I'm always upping him. Because he, he and I had several of the same mentors, including Dr. Yosef ben and Dr. John Henry Clark. And I haven't had a chance to tell Kamathi, but... I can promise him that they would be enormously proud of how he represents our profession. And I know I am. No doubt. No doubt. My, uh, my profession had a similar rule, but less elegantly stated. Don't make shit up. <laughs> <laughs> I like yours better. <laughs> Yours, yours was a lot clearer. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Paul, Paul took it around. He, he broke it down. And you just <laughs> you just said, I'm just going to simplify it. Um, speak, speaking of your profession, you know, I can't just let you go. I mean, I know you, you've you interviewed everyone from Bobby Kennedy to, I mean, who, who are some of these folks? Because I, I want people to know the, um, the, 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 the force and not just, okay, you just some old white dude to say the interview, Malcolm, and went to lunch with him. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I want, you know, uh, Paul, you want to help me out with this? Because I know that, uh, you know, uh, Pete, Peter's a little shy. So, you know, who, who are some of these other folks that uh, that you've had the uh, you've worked with through interviews or whatever? Well, well, well my I was assigned. <laughs> Actually, I volunteered for what used to be known as the race beat when I uh, joined Newsweek. And so uh, uh, I got to know, either know or sort of know a lot of the, a lot of the leaders of the, uh, of the black struggle um, on, on all sides. I've told Paul many times that um, that struggle is one struggle with many tendencies. So I never took sides uh, much as I actually loved Malcolm X. I didn't say, okay, black people, you've all, all got to follow Malcolm X. That's not a white guy's decision to make. So I gave props to Roy Wilkins of the NAA, Whitney Young of the Urban League, who was actually a friend of mine, um, Bayard Rustin, who I loved and admired, um, uh, James Farmer, um, the, the, the gamut of the black leadership. And, and as SNCC came on scene, I got to know some, not all of the leaders. Uh, Dr. King, I only got to interview once. 
uh, and uh, it's the only time in my career I cut an interview short. It was, Paul will remember the scope training session. Uh, um, Southern, Le Southern Christian Leadership Conference was organizing something like the so-called Freedom Summer in Mississippi. They wanted to do it the next, do something similar the next year, attract a lot of uh, students, including white students, uh, uh, into a summer uh, campaign. And uh, Bayard Rustin, who was a great f favorite of mine, uh, was at their training camp. And th there had been a very, very, very long day. Uh, it was was pushing, it was 1030 or maybe, maybe closer to 11 at night when uh, Rustin came up to me, grabbed my elbow, and he said, you really, you really ought to interview uh, Dr. King. And, uh, and he led me into the back room of a meeting hall where King was uh, resting and looking groggy. Uh, he had had a, an extremely long day. He'd been, uh, he'd been preaching, he'd been strategizing, he'd been meeting with his his crew and uh, so I, I interviewed him for about a half hour and his eyes were getting heavy lidded and uh, so I folded my notebook and said I've, I've got enough thank you thank you Dr. King and uh, and walked uh, he probably would have gone on but he might have fallen asleep the next sentence uh, I just felt for him uh, I'm, Journalism is supposed to be a tough game, a heartless game. I'm afflicted with uh, other tendencies like human feeling. <laughs> you know, that, that, that's funny to hear you say, I only interviewed Dr. King once, like, you know, like uh, that's just something. But I mean, it's, it's, you know, I hate to hear he was tired, but at the same time, you know, it's like, uh, I mean that that's a uh, remarkable career. You talked in uh, uh, forty plus years and in interviewing so many uh, icons, cultural icons, and uh, historical figures. Yeah. You know that that that's a, that's a serious thing. Um, yeah, Brother Kalonji, I'd yes, like sir. to ask Peter's opinion of the brother over my shoulder. Hmm. Probably uh, can. Yeah, I've been noticing uh, the photo. In my opinion, was he was the most appealing. I, I as I, as the, uh, as the flow of news changed, I got to be more uh, national politics, uh, doing more national politics, uh, uh, much less, <coughs> much less of the. Of, of the uh, race beat, uh, Newsweek by then had become had begun hiring uh, a lot of talented black writers, reporters, uh, uh, and uh, uh, and I, I moved into mainstream politics, and I covered I, I covered at least parts of every campaign from 64 um, to through uh, 2008. Wow. And the guy over Paul's shoulder is Robert Kennedy. And he was the most compelling political figure I've ever encountered at any level of politics. Uh, and uh, the reaction of the press to him was, uh, 
the political press is is supposed to be cynical, and uh, you got on the print on the uh, Kennedy press plane, and it was like a flying love affair. I've never seen anything like it. Uh, everyone, all the all these hard bitten or soft bitten reporters like me. <laughs> uh, uh, was in love with the guy. I told Paul a story about a guy named, uh, a guy from the Washington Post named Richard Harwood. Uh, tough, tough former Marine. Uh, uh, came aboard the, the plane, hating Kennedy. He's a ruthless little MF. <laughs> uh, after, by the end of the campaign, they had become close pals. Uh, they'd get out of the plane on the tarmac and throw a football back and forth to each other. Um, and uh, Harwood had become a dedicated fan, as everyone else was, including me and my my wife and uh, 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 he represented something. And Paul's Paul's been probing this since um, he represented an ability to connect with not just black people, indigenous people, Hispanic people, poor white people, uh, and connect in a really strong emotional way. Uh, uh, and so you saw people, you saw all the left out people in our, in our political world want to touch him, uh, wanted to, wanted to be near him. Um, grabbing when he was in a motorcade, grabbing at him just to be able to maybe touch his hand or grab his shirt sleeve, his uh, shirt sleeve or his jacket sleeve. Um, it's the most, it's the most uh, amazing thing I've seen in politics. Uh, uh, that response. And this was a guy who came into presidential politics as the tough, ruthless. Ruthless was almost part of his name in mainstream journalism. Uh, uh, the ruthless Bobby Kennedy. Uh, um, and I, I, interviewed, I interviewed him a few times before he ran for president. And uh, I found him to be the opposite. Uh, uh, he was a man of feeling, of empathy, empathy like no politician I've ever seen. Uh, uh, and he got shot for it. Uh, happens in our wonderful uh, world, happened to Malcolm, happened to Dr. King, happened to Jack, uh, happened to Medgar Evers, happened to three kids in Mississippi who thought they could do the world some good. Um, a lot of others. Uh, we're a nation with too many martyrs. You know, since you mentioned, you know, you guys mentioned Bobby Kennedy this year, uh, Sirhan Sirhan has been um, released. What a... No, he hasn't. I mean, well, he's up for pro, correct? And uh, the uh, governor, Gavin Newsom, has made statements that inclined towards the position of Bobby Kennedy's widow, widow Ethel. And unfortunately, he's liable to continue to rot in prison. Ah, okay. I missed that. I appreciate that correction. Um, I mean, just from the interviews and both you guys being researchers, scholars, so on and so forth, um, you know, what, what is your position on the, on the assassination of Bobby Kennedy 
you know, or would you say it wasn't Sirhan Sirhan or what, what would be your uh, your position? I'll answer first, if you don't mind, Peter. No, I'd prefer you answer. Uh, um, dealing with I, Malcolm X's never, assassination has been so, so painful for me that I'm not trying to look at anybody else's assassination. <laughs> I'm concentrating right. on Bobby Kennedy's relationship with non-white people. I could care less what his relationship with white people was. Let, let white scholars do that. I'm concentrating on his relationship with us. Uh, so why I have read some things, as I said, this thing with Malcolm is Malcolm X is just I don't I'm I'm just not going there. Yeah. And uh my wife covered the uh, Sirhan trial and uh, uh she thought the state made its case. Um there are questions about whether he was alone or whether he was but I never got deep enough, and I, I'm kind of with Paul on that one. Um, I felt to um, I felt too much love for Bobby to want to press that case. Uh, in contrast to Malcolm X, where I thought there was a, where I came to think there was a genuine miscarriage of justice. Uh, Right on. Hey, brothers, I appreciate you spending this time uh, with me. I expect an hour we hit up too. So that that's that's um, you know definitely an honor to have you all uh, come on. Um, you know, it's definitely a, a, a powerful discussion, and uh, you both are welcome back anytime. Of course, Paul already told me don't ever ask some certain questions again. So. You know. <laughs> Glad he, he did more than he said he was going to do, you know what I mean, before we got on. So I definitely, uh, we definitely appreciate it. We appreciate your love for um, for <laughs> both Malcolm and, you know, and, and, and the people as a whole. So definitely we appreciate it, man. So um, anything you all want to say before we uh, part for this moment in time? I just um, want to th I want to thank both you and Paul for um, you Kalanji for doing this and for for hosting it and Paul for being my very longtime friend and for uh, correcting me when I got stuff wrong <laughs> and uh, for helping me in my in this uh, long pursuit for justice for for uh, Aziz and Islam, so uh, uh, so I owe both of you a lot. Man, listen, we we are definitely Kaloji. Uh, Kaloji, I've been a journalist since nineteen seventy five or mm -hmm. seventy six, and uh, as you know. Most of the platforms for most of my life have been owned by our enemies. And we couldn't speak our own truth. And the reason I've been a fan of yours for a long time is because you provide one of the freest forms for our people. And your show has range and depth, but most of all, it's rooted in the love for our people. And I don't usually do media interviews, as you probably notice. But I've been an admirer of yours for a long time. And Appreciate what you stand for. And uh, thank you again for making it possible for Peter to tell his own story. I'm glad that there's gonna be a record of this. And uh, thank you for understanding why I never, <laughs> never wanna talk about this again. Brother, we, I am definitely grateful, man, uh, for you taking the time to talk about it at all. Um, I think this was, to be honest with you, prior to this, uh, to this conversation, I'd say, I kind of, um, I didn't know what direction it was going to go in. And, you know, some of the questions, I'm, like I said, I'm grateful for you putting it together and, and for both of you coming on and thank you for, you know, for the kind words. It, it's, it's, it's absolutely encouraging, you know, because of the fact that as I'm sure both of you men know that, um, 
there are these days when you feel like uh you know am, am i the only one who cares about what's going on yeah you know what i'm saying so uh I, I appreciate you all for being understanding uh you know and and i i mean like i said just forever grateful um it was something else i was going to say but you know thank you is the is, is the best words and uh you know i'm looking forward to uh you know working with you all in the future on whatever we can and i, I just want to point out too because uh for the for the viewers uh peter goldman kept telling me look i'm an 88 year old man i don't remember much of nothing <laughs> I'm, I'm 80 he, he, he tried he tried to hit me with the age card you know but <laughs> <laughs> Paul, Paul said he was front, so he said push the issue front big time. Yeah, yeah. So I, I, I might, I might write a book with uh just the pages of the email from the past four days. <laughs> I think that'd be a bestseller. But, but yeah. So I mean, I don't. If, if you forgot anything and you did this good with what you forgot, I, I ain't know what you. <laughs> I've I've forgotten a ton. I'll tell you. Um, uh, but uh, it goes with age. I'm blessed to have lived this long, I guess. Uh, and uh, uh, we're blessed you've lived this long. Yes. Uh, <laughs> oh, Paul. love you, I love you, Peter. I I love you, Paul. I've I've well, just Peter fallen in love. I've I've just fallen in love with you, Kalanji. <laughs> hey, that's all right, brother. You know what I'm saying? It's cool. I love you too, man. I feel like a family reunion. What you say, a bro hug? <laughs> Y'all go come some bro hugs real quick. <laughs> but definitely, uh, uh, definitely appreciate you all. Keep up the the the. Uh, I mean, I don't even know if keep up the good work is 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 a proper statement because of the fact that you two have put in more work than a whole lot of people I know. Um, and you help to pave a way, pave the way for, uh, you know, many to come. So again, I salute you all and uh, thank you for joining us today. Stay black. Amen. Thank Look, you. You too, Peter. The other way. <laughs> thank you, Paul. Peter, Peter, you're invited to the cookout, as they say. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Checking out Riot Starter TV. We were joined by Paul Lee and Peter Goldman, uh, two two heavyweights when it comes to uh, the shining Black Prince El Hodge Malik Shabazz, uh, Malcolm X. Uh, to be honest with you, I, I don't know. In, in 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 my mind and in my spirit, I felt like I didn't know too many people who uh, loved and appreciated El Hodge Malik Shabazz. Um, as, as I do. So it's grateful to always see more. Not that there aren't folks that do, because I know there are plenty, but to dedicate uh, each one of these guys um, 50 years, at least half a century of, um, you know, working on behalf of setting the record straight, you know. So again, we thank you all uh, for joining us tonight. Uh, make sure you subscribe to Black Power Media and do us a favor share this video because of the fact that this right here this is this is documentation it is a historical point um i've done a ton of different interviews and um this is definitely in the top three if not number one so i'm just gonna say that for the record but anyway um in the more the words the the, the brother paul lee y'all stay black and for those y'all out there who ain't black then get black Anyway, <laughs> we out of here. Black Power Movement, Black Power TV, Black Power Media, Riot Started TV. Salute.